warmly welcomed. This was uh, very strong, <laughs> looking at your film and uh, in the end you are entering like this. So I think we are very moved and touched uh, right now, the whole audience. And thank you so much for taking your time to come here today. Um, <laughs> and uh, we will uh, have a question from the audience, but first I would like maybe you, Jamila, to start with the, you are the executive director for the center, the Albert Einstein Center. Could you tell us a little bit, because now you have been working there for 10 years, if I understood it right. How has it been? And, uh, and uh, tell us more about the work you're doing right now, today. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. Oh, oh sorry. Closer. Oh, I, closer. Okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much. It's very good to be here. Um, uh, I am the executive director of the Albert Einstein Institution. I've been, as, uh, as was just said, I've been working with Jean for 10 years. This has been a very interesting 10 years uh, for the world and for also specifically the development of the field of nonviolent struggle and also specifically, even more specifically, really for the history of the organization, which was set up in 1983 by, by Jean Sharp um, and since then has really evolved quite a bit and has played a major role in the promotion of both the study of nonviolent struggle and also its use uh, for acute conflicts around the world. So. I've been very fortunate when, when I started working at the institution, it was a, it was a, a sort of a, a small staff and then for various reasons, partly because we lost funding, we became a staff of two. So the film that, you know, the, the office that you see in this film was a period of time which was quite difficult for us. It was difficult because at the very time that our resources were shrinking, the interest in the work was growing and the demand for the work was growing, the need was growing, and people were contact, contacting us more often and needing more books and things and we were in a position where we had a lot of difficulty in being responsive to those needs. Um, more recently, of course, we've seen developments in the world, uh, in, in part the, the Arab Spring and the revolutions in North Africa and elsewhere in the Middle East and uh, that's really brought about a great deal of new attention to the work. So this means that it's been attention from the media. Uh, lots and lots of it. Jean will probably refer to that, you know, uh, a period of six weeks where we had back-to-back uh, -back interviews all day long. And that was very, very exciting, which also means that it brought the work uh, to the attention of many other people around the world who began to ask, how can this type of struggle be used for the issues that I care about in my situation? So it's raised the need for the work even more. It's raised our profile very high. It allows us to do the things like be here today. And part of that is also uh, due to this, this new film. Uh, so we've been really grateful for for all of the support. The needs continue though, we're working very hard, but we're very, very excited about, uh, about the future of our organization, the future of, of nonviolent struggle and its use for people who are in great need um, in many different parts of the world. So that's, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. I hope to hear more about it later. Uh, but uh, I introduce you, Rory Arrow. You've made this film and you are a journalist and director. And uh, you wrote it and directed it and co-produced it. So we are very curious. How has it been? And uh, have you? What? What are you? Uh, what do you bring with you? And uh, yeah, it has to be a, quite a journey, I guess. <laughs> um, yes, it's been uh, it's been an incredible journey and an incredible incredible privilege to make a film like this. I think I was a journalist, a newspaper journalist, and a television journalist for about sort of six or seven years before I started to make this film. And I think as a journalist, you always want that one story to make a real difference, you know, a real difference in the world. And I think I was very lucky to, um, to make this film. And I, I remember a period of about a year when I decided that I really wanted to make the film and just being worried every night that someone, some other filmmaker was going to get in there before me um, and make it so, so a very scary time. Uh, and also, you know, it's actually, 
it's a very brave thing of Gene to do, to open himself up to having a film made by someone who was, you know, uh, a very, well, first time, first time filmmaker, although it was a reasonably uh, experienced journalist by that point. So uh, the funding was obviously quite difficult. Uh, we, you know, I, I uh, put a lot of personal funding into it, but it was finally funded by um, using Kickstarter, crowdfunding site, and we asked for uh, $30,000 and um, there was such a reaction to Gene's work that we achieved $60,000 in under three weeks, um, which was really incredible. And it, it's a great way to fund a film like this. You know, it was a crowdfunded film. It's all about people power, and people from all around the world helps us fund this film and, and get it made. Um, and so it's, it's really just been fantastic. And it's now uh, been on television in 23 countries. Um, it's uh, been translated into ten languages, including Russian. The Russian authorities were told a, a channel who had translated it into Russian and were going to broadcast it not to broadcast it, they broadcast it anyway. Um, and it's been shown by Al Jazeera across the Middle East, as far as uh, Japan and uh, Malaysia. And it continues to be shown uh, by uh, democracy activists and groups in places where it, they would not be allowed to show it and they, they might be arrested if they showed it and it's being sort of smuggled around and held in secrets. Screening, so it's really had a sort of a very interesting life as a first as a conventional film, as a, a cinema documentary, and then as an educational tool, and then as, as something that is assisting the knowledge and, of, uh, and spread of Jean's work to introduce them to work and, and to get them to read the books, which is the most important thing. Hmm. <laughs> All right. I think you can. will elaborate more. You will get more questions. But Jean Sharp. You are uh, the world's foremost expert on non-violent struggle and uh, you've spent a lifetime of, into ad academic work that has been so needed for, for the non-violent resistance that we see today all over the world. Um, thank you so much for your work, also the, all the three of you. And uh, congratulations to the prize you received this Friday, um, the Right Livelihood Award. And as Jamila said, there has been a lot of journalists now since the Arab Spring. People are kind of awakening and uh, as I heard before, you said that the journalists didn't come with the, with the preconceived views on nonviolence that they had before. So something has changed now. Uh, and I also heard that you have been said that saying that the tipping point will come. People will understand what strategic nonviolent struggle is. And uh, do you think that time is here now? Um, yeah. Yeah. The client there. Did it go to be Harry Swag? I think something dramatic has happened. I, I was telling people who were working with me, <coughs> predominantly in the United States, but not exclusively, that there will, time, there will come a breakthrough. So the work you're doing now and your studies will eventually be wanted. And after so many months and several, quite a few years, they began to doubt that that was true. And now, with the evidence of the people of Tunisia and in Egypt and other parts of the world too, people now understand. Those journalists, they didn't come as was just said, but the old preconceptions. For example, that you have to have a Mahatma or the nominal struggle takes forever, or you have to become a pacifist, or something like that. Those old preconceptions are gone. We had hundreds of journalists come to see us, and not one of those journalists had any of those several preconceptions anymore. It, there's been a major breakthrough in understanding of the reality that we've tried to present over so many years with great difficulty. If it hadn't been for Jamila's help, for example, our institution would not have survived. There's people like her and the work that Rory has been doing and other people that not only we've survived, but now people are saying, yes, we want to know about this. 
This isn't something you can just do with your heart and your inspiration. That's okay, but it isn't enough for sure. But it's something that is really merits and requires serious examination and serious study. And we've been trying to prepare the resources so people will have that material that sound not imaginative, not dreamy, but of what really has happened and what really can happen in the future. Hmm. A personal question. Were you surpri uh, surprised when the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt started? Or were you like, ah, oh, finally? Or were you su surprised that it happened? I was surprised. We had had Egyptians and Syrians and many other people coming to us and sometimes asking, what should we do? And I rather shocked them and said, I, I refuse to tell them. I can't tell you what to do. If I tell you what to do, it'll be wrong, and you'll make a big mistake, and then you'll be able to blame me. <laughs> yeah. But it, it happened in a way that, and to a degree, and in ways that I did not predict, and I could not imagine. But then people often have the capacity to do wonderful things that are not expected, and give a lesson to other people what they can do also if they use their heads. I will soon let you in, so you can think about your questions in the audience. But before I ask you, Jamila, to the Swedish audience who haven't read about um, civil resistance and non-violent struggle at all, uh, where do you recommend us to start? Okay, very good question. Um, well, Jean has uh, done a great deal of writing on this topic, so you have a lot to choose from. Um, you know, uh, people do ask us in terms of introductory uh, pieces. There's one called There Are Realistic Alternatives, and it's sort of an essay length. So you can select, depending on what depth of understanding you want, whether you want to start, you know, whether you want to read 15 pages or 900 pages or more. So all of that and everything in between is on our website at aeinstein.org. And, uh, you know, any more specific recommendations that you need, you are free to contact our office and we can point you in the right direction. Yeah, yes. there is and quite a lot to find in your uh, Of your course. And then website. there is the, there is the classic, uh, uh, well, the, the politics of nonviolent action is Jean's big, big important book, and then from dictatorship to democracy, which is really the one that has spread uh, all over the world and which people are finding to be extremely relevant because it is so clear and precise, but also conveys quite a serious, uh, you know, it conveys it seriously, it conveys it quite, quite in depth. So uh, that's that's one that you also maybe maybe interested in, in uh, reading. Yeah. yeah, I think we have a lot of reading to do. Uh, and uh, now I have a question here from you, and uh, please use the microphone. Uh, my name is Afra, I'm uh, like an um, Arab Spring political refugee here, you can call it. And I have two questions uh, for Jean and the filmmaker. Um, uh, for the filmmaker, I was wondering, are you happy about the the segment uh, about Egypt that was presented since there have been a lot of dramatic developments after that. Um, and for Jean, I'm, like, I'm very privileged to be standing in front of you and asking you this question. But I was wondering, uh, uh, like the, the documentary is called How uh, to Start a Revolution. And there could be like another discussion, like how to suppress a revolution. Uh, which uh, consists a lot of dimensions from the dictatorships and supporting dictatorships uh, from external forces. Do you have any comment about that? And um, yeah, thank you. So, uh, do you want to start, Jim? Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, otherwise, I will. I'll get confused. Yes, <laughs> do so then. <laughs> Easily done. Mm. It's important not only to start a revolution, which was not our title in the first place, anyhow. It's okay. But what do you do after you start? How you conduct your struggle skillfully, not not loyally, not uh, all kinds of other things, but using your heads and strategy wisely. And then after the old regime is brought down, be careful. The struggle is not necessarily over. 
you will find other people want to step into the role of the old oppressive regime, as happened in Russia in 1917 with the Bolsheviks, with the consequences we know, as happened in Iran with the Ayatollahs, as we know. There are ways you can prepare for those situations because, you know, even foreign intelligence agencies, or maybe especially foreign intelligence agencies, who want to be involved and use this for their purposes. You can prepare for that. We have a booklet which is called the anti-coup. Those coup d'etat or coup usurpations has happened in those particular cases and can happen in others. You have to prepare how to block them before they start, how to defeat them once they start. And that can be done, but not just by inspiration, by thinking and analyzing and planning and think, learning how this struggle really works. Uh, we have a new booklet in about is it six weeks. We'll be at Abel's the Press. It's based on work done for years and years and with other people's help. It's called How Nonviolent Struggle Works. Because if you don't know how it operates, if you don't know what can make it successful or what can defeat it, you won't be able to do it. So that's condensed, maybe 900 pages or more down to only about 100 pages in English. And there's been interesting translations already. There are other things you can do, but you have to prepare and plan. And then how to deal with the situation if there's executive usurpations again, if the regime decides to take on new controls and new powers, how that can be brought. So a real regime of democracy and greater freedom can be brought into existence. Just answer that. Yes. Um, yes, I think the, question, the second question, well, the first question was, uh, am I happy with the uh, part of the film? Uh, am I happy with part of the film? The, uh, of Egypt, and I think, um, you know, as a filmmaker, especially making a film about su such such current events which are still developing, it's a real challenge because obviously you make a television documentary, you can have a quite a quick turnaround. You can make a film and it can be on TV within a week. You make a cinema do documentary, it takes three, two months to edit quite often, and you don't know where to stop. So how can you make a film about? Uh, a subject which is still evolving, so it's it's very difficult. So we try to make it as watertight as possible. And though I'm, you know, very sort of, uh, self-critical about you know how you do it, and you're always worried that you miss something or you uh, misinterpret something. Uh, I think it was done as well as it could have been done at the time. So it, the film completed in September last year. So that was our that was when the film clo you know closed down. And I think we've gone through several. You know, we've had this film on tour now for over a year and there have been several times when it looked like the revolution was definitely not going to work when, when the army was in power and then there was times where it looked more ho hopeful um, and now we're in another uh, period as well and um, I think uh, what you have to, I think it's important to know when the film stops. I think a lot of people go come into a screening and they go, but what, why didn't you say anything about Occupy? Occupy, you know, started the day after we premiered the film. And uh, so I get this question a lot, but interestingly, Occupy have used the film um, all over the US and Europe in, in sort of tent screenings and, and things. But uh, as, far, as far as that goes, um, you know, I think we, we did the best that we could. I think it holds up quite well. Obviously, the Syrian section now does not hold up um, very well at all. Uh, but I would still say that there, uh, there are still uh, news reports of Syrians using nonviolent struggle, even though there is a, uh, a violent struggle, and obviously by violent struggle taking place. So just because the news media fixates on violence in many cases, that can lead to a perception that all nonviolent struggle has just completely ceased, and that is not necessarily true. Um, but I think what uh, the recent events in Egypt, Egypt do show is the population uh, are so mobilized and have won such great successes by their actions that now they are holding the current president to account in a much stronger way than they did before and winning concessions. And that's very positive. So that re remains the, you know, the core of the film, that great achievements can be 
won by this film. It doesn't mean things are going to be perfect, but it, there is great power with this technique, and, and that's what's important. So. Thank you. So, uh, here we have another question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Francesco Candelari. I work at the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm very grateful for um, this opportunity. I have two questions. Um, the first one, in fact, joins probably uh, a little bit what uh, the person before me asked. And uh, uh, in the process from dictatorship to democracy, there is certainly a part which is which comes right now, specifically you now in Tunisia and Egypt, which is the uh, constructive part. Um, and so um, I would be interested to hear more about that part because it seems one of the points uh, of the main points for the youth that were able to go into the streets and now question themselves what to do next. Um, the second question I have is a little bit of a curiosity also. Uh, towards the end of the movie, um, we see um, the, these people that were working to support, in fact, the Syrian revolution that come to you uh, to uh, ask a series of questions and to discuss uh, the situation and how to, how to move forward. Uh, but we don't hear what you, you, what you discussed and what were eventually your answers. And so I would be very interested since, of course, Syria is, is uh, 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 a big question mark on how to deal non-violently uh, with a dictatorship. Thank you. Let me deal with the last question first because then you can remind me of your first question. <laughs> I get easily confused. Uh, Syrians were among the groups that have come to us in recent years and asking what can we do, what should, what should we do, really wanting advice and guidance. And I shock them all. I'm not going to tell you because I don't know your situation. If I give you advice, it might, it probably would be wrong, and then you'll be in big trouble. But many of the questions involving the Syrians and other people are what became drawing upon our oral meetings with Syrians and other people, and on the extent, extended correspondence are put in with heavy involvement of Jamila during all of this, put into a guide which we call self-liberation. That's a bit of a shocking title that people can liberate themselves. But they can do it and they have been doing it. But you can't do it on the basis of inspiration only. Inspiration helps, but it's only a small start. You have to know what you're doing. And you have to know what you're doing about your situation, or whatever the situation is. And that's the first thing you need to know. Then you need to understand nonviolent struggle in depth. Not because you've seen an inspiring film. Not because you heard about Gandhi sometime, you know. Not because you, Martin Luther King got a Nobel Peace Prize next door in Norway, you know. But understand it in depth, really. It's more complicated, my opinion is, than military struggle. So you have an awful lot to learn. And for that, you're not going to get by talking to somebody or having a, a workshop, important as they are. You're going to get by studying. Now, this is a guide of 70 pages, but don't be deceived. It's a guide to reading 900 pages in English to get the basic beginnings and then you have a chance of reasoning from that but that alone is again is not enough you have to know how strategy works what you have to be able to think strategically not how to witness oh that's a, I've done that been there done that is American expression but how you can actually reason what is needed how you're going to take first steps, how you're going to move in that, when your opponents react against you, how you're going to respond, 
to think strategically like military officers do. And then you can plan your own strategy. And if you want to remind me of your first question, sir? Constructive program. Constructive program is very important. Yeah. You've got this one, this one now. Uh oh. Uh, miniaturized. <laughs> small scale production. But small and beautiful. Is that okay at that? Can you hear that? Can you all hear me now? If not, jump up and down to scream or something. <laughs> I get, you get it. I get to notice you. Because I can't see you all very well in the particular light. Uh, some of you who have studied Gandhi and the struggles in India know that a big part of Gandhi's program was the constructive program. Not the organizing of civil disobedience, not the going to prisons, not being beaten on the head at, in various places, but, but how to really conduct additional work, how to get the rights of women, how to get the rights of intestinal and on down the line. That was very important. We can say it in modern terms, in different ways, civil society, social institutions, they have been very important. They were very important in not drawing on that history at all, but in Norway during the struggle against Quisling and the Nazi occupation. It was teach the remnants of the teacher organization that had been made illegal. They continued functioning. That had been able the teachers to conduct if effective, decisive resistance against the Quisling occupation. There's a book on that by Thomas Wheeler, the organization organizations ruled out on the record which on it. Very important. I don't imagine it's so impressed, unfortunately. It needs to be brought back. But that case, if you're going to plan how to conduct future struggles, what are going to be the organizational basis on which will help that to be happening? And how can, if you don't have the organizations there, how can you create them so that they will become reliable helpers for the population? Because if we people think they are one person alone, you, we can't do too much alone. There was many people alone coming together. You can do a lot. And if they have previous experience in working together during so-called peace times, then that's really preferred. If not, how do you form new organizations to be able to carry this out? It would vary from country to country, different situations. So there's no one plan for everywhere. Special programs need to be developed in each country and sometimes in each political situation. Can I have a follow-up question on that? Uh, because I think some time Gandhi said that he spent 80%, he devoted 80% of his lifetime to the constructive program to build what he wanted, uh, ashrams and so on and 20% on non-violent struggle against the oppress oppressor, um, like resistance. So, what do you think of his priorities? Was it, uh, uh, was it wise, you think? Yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd like to add something. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they study Jean's writings and our work, they think it's really about how do you bring down the oppressive system, how do you topple the dictatorship, how do you fight an invasion. But equally important, extremely important, is how do you strengthen the society so that it's able to resist effectively and powerfully. And that really depends on the building of institutions, um, and, and strengthening the institutions, and if those institutions don't exist, then, then creating them. Because as you're weakening the oppressive system, you need uh, organizations that can fill those, those needs. And so that piece is very, very important. So, you know, also strengthening society, that's, that's important, not just identifying the weakness of dictatorships and how do you, how do you uh, disintegrate those. Thank you. So, um, the lady in the red hat. Um, you, I think you might have partly answered this, but in the movie you mentioned that you wrote from dictatorship to democracy partly at the request of some Burmese people, but in Burma we didn't see a people power movement topple the government or the military regime. Okay, sorry. So my question is, 
If you look at some cases where nonviolent action has been less successful, are you able to identify some factors that are commonly missing, or what are some mistakes that nonviolent activists often make? And here's the second question. Hold on. Yeah. Or maybe we start with that one. Yeah. yeah. I think one big mistake is people think we're ready to do it now. To think that they already know as much as they need to know. That they don't have to study and plan. People often ask about Tiananmen Square. I was there for a few days. There was no planning, no strategy, no vision of what's going to happen. So it's no wonder it was a disaster in many ways. At the same time, it was very inspiring. But you have to use your heads in this field. Gandhi often insisted that Namatso was heavily intellectual. Many of the advocates of nonviolence in quotation marks, it's not the phrase I prefer, really think they already are ready to go. So just a minute, let's go do something. I would suggest, wait a minute, you have something to learn and plan, and then here's a chance you can do it and be more successful, and you can deal with the tough parts as well, more adequately. Um, I was going to ask a question about um, about Europe, really. Um, I think many of us would identify the current crisis, um, at least to some extent, as a crisis of democracy as well. Um, and though we can see a lot of sort of resistance across Europe uh, to some of the austerity programs, um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts um, on strategy when you live in a representative democracy, um, but still have some major democratic problems. And I suppose adding to that, following to your answer to the last question, um, if you think that there is perhaps a lack of planning um, in some of the movements, both in Europe, but also the Occupy movement um, in the States and around the world. I wouldn't assume to have an adequate response to all of that. My own knowledge and awareness is more limited than it should be. I would have a brief comment on the Occupy movement, a case where there's inspiration. People decide they must do something. That they want to make people aware of the gross problems, economic problems, political problems, on down the line. But there's an assumption that if you go and sit down in a piece of geography, and stay there as long as you can without being carried out, that that will somehow change the, the, the distribution of power and money in the United States, for example. And it, it won't. That's merely an inspiration to start doing something much more fundamental. And don't be naive. If you set your, if you set your dream up with big goal and you don't have a way really to get there, people will become disillusioned and dismiss what you're saying in the long run. So it's a very big issue to be dealt with. But do it with thinking and planning. Using the guide self-liberation is adaptable for all kinds of situations in different parts of the world, in different kinds of political systems. So what's relevant in, in Russian, Russia today is not what's relevant in Stockholm today. And that's not well, what is relevant in Trinidad today, you know. All this needs to be worked out by your situation. And the, the guide that we prepared for that is a start, at least. And how does it operate in a democratic system? It, it, Would you like to come and lead yourself? We don't care. OK. No, um, I just wanted to say that you know, uh, there's, there's writings that, um, that, that really can guide you into how this can operate when you're not operating against a single dictatorship, a single entity, but how it can lead to greater popular empowerment of a society like Sweden or like the United States, where there are uh, institutions, uh, where there is you know, at least uh, you know, a representative democracy. And so uh, you know, those, those guides can be helpful. And those are in a book called Social Power and Political Freedom. Um, and Jean, the specific chapter is called, uh, is it? 
Civil disobedience in a democracy. Right, there you go. Civil disobedience in a democracy and why that's uh, very important for, um, uh, pre for pre preserving that democracy in a, in a democratic system. So that's uh, possibly online, but it, but it may not be. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. hmm? um, I understand you, you are a scientist, right? <coughs> it was mentioned in the, uh, in the film more than that you have um, done academic work. Can you hear me? No. Yes? I can't hear you. Into the mic, maybe? Yes, you are a scientist, both of you, I understand. Uh, you're a scientist, you're saying you've done academic work. Uh, uh, most of my life has been doing academic work, yes. Yes, yes. Well, I have uh, studied uh, uh, peace and conflict studies, political science, and so on. And um, uh, here in Sweden, they make a difference between old ordinary social science and normative social science like uh, peace and conflict studies, human rights, and so on. Um, um, when I was looking at the documentary, uh, I thought, why aren't they working inside of a university? Why, are they, why don't they get funds from universities, and so on? Um, so, <clears throat> um, I would like to um, hear more about the reaction that the general social science community has um, had on your work. You understand? And the reaction that you have been getting over the years on your work, because I know that many social scientists, especially political scientists in the United States and in Europe, would say that this is not uh, real science. <laughs> and um, what, what are your thoughts about that? That's an important question. I, for some reason, I don't remember having received that particular criticism. I welcome criticisms. People telling me what's wrong with what I've done, what could be done better, that's all good. It's where, you know, I, I've been in academia, so to speak. I did not only a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and then I was in doing more propaganda work with the Peace newspaper in London. And then I was invited to the university in Norway by Professor Ananis in philosophy. And that led to a time for doing research with the Institute for Social Research in Oslo. And then I realized I didn't know enough about power. So somehow I managed, believe it or not, to my surprise, got into Oxford of all places which is not known as a hotbed of radicalism, you know, and, and studied there on power. I was there for four years and finally got a DPhil from Oxford, again academia. Find out, is this really as good as it sounds at first? You know, you can be tricked sometimes by pretty words, you know, and good intentions and big smiles. But, but study, and then what is the, what skill do you have, or what skill can you get to assist this? You know, Roy was making films long before I mean, he, he was trying to make them anyhow at the time. <laughs> he's done a superb job by what he's done. But someone else is a journalist, so they do interviews. Some of the big things that have helped in to get this work spread before the Arab Spring was journalist articles. Someone writing a policy of the Wall Street Journal, a huge article on the spread of this kind of knowledge and resistance, that this kind of knowledge has been spreading. People writing even for the New York Times, which again, we couldn't have managed this. I learned that you don't get into those places by pushing. You get into those places, in my experience, by doing the hard work and let people see what you're doing. Then they take it seriously, and then they push it without being pushed, you know. And I think that's that's very important. Someone else may have totally different experiences. There may be a particular injustice in your societies. In the early Swedish political de democracy development, there was a time when all men, well, not women, all men could not vote. So what did the Swedes do? I don't know much about it, but they used a general strike nonviolent action to demand the right for all men at least to vote and the women
women's suffrage movements in various countries, I don't know about it in Sweden, but in England and the United States, organized and organized and demonstrated and went, were beaten and went to jail. You know, that's how women got the vote in some of these countries. What is needed in your country? In the United States, we've had domestic issues and still have them. The problem, the problem of the poor, before it was the problem of the African Americans, which to some degree is certainly still there, a problem. But the advances can be made. But the rights of, uh, of how to deal with people who are doing terrible things in our society, how can that be corrected? Are people given an alternative means of action? I mean, you think about that and come up with your own perception of what's needed. And instead, use the self-liberation guide as to how this kind of stroke can be used for that particular situation, which you become an expert on yourself. Hello, Madeline. It's very nice to see you because I know we've been, we've been in touch quite a number of times through Facebook and we've appreciated your support. So already I think that you, you are playing a role in spreading information about our work and so that is very much appreciated. Um, you know, we've em emphasized the need for funding because many people think that all this work was produced you know, with a staff of two and therefore maybe we should continue like that. Um, but that's not, that's not the reality. This institution has been around for quite a number of years. We're now entering our 30th year. And the, the major work, of course, Jean started decades ago before the Albert Einstein Institution. But a lot of the work and the spread of the work was assisted by uh, an institution that had a much larger staff than what you see in the film. We were, at one point, before my time, 11 people. And Jean was able to write from dictatorship to democracy be only because, uh, it, it, you know, he may have still done it, it would have taken much longer, uh, with, the, with the help of two staff. So, you know, we really emphasize the need for funding because, you know, without it, this work is going to be heavily, uh, you know, uh, uh, much more difficult, heavily pressured. And so, you know, as attention increases, it's got to be facilitated by increased funding. We're seeing examples of how our financial situation is changing. We've had uh, new support. Um, we've, had, we've had new support from foundations, but as we said in the film, foundations and sort of the, the traditional funding bodies have been hesitant to support this work because it is, doesn't fit into people's sort of preconceptions or narrow categories of what they think is important. People are recognizing now that the work is important. So if they recognize that it's important, they should also recognize that it requires funding and that it merits that funding. So we've been, we've been really grateful for the new openness uh, for this work, and I think that's going to be very important for, for the future of this field. There's also sort of specific skills um, that can be very helpful for this work. Jean mentioned the need for bringing greater attention to nonviolent struggles in the world. So in the various networks that you all have, it's very important that you, first of all, learn, that you learn how this technique operates so that you can recognize it when you see it in different events in the world and you can share that information with your own networks. That's very important because we live in societies where often it's the violence and the dramatic acts that get attention and nonviolent struggle is also very exciting and very dramatic and uh, the information needs to be spread. And I had one more thought, um, but perhaps I can, I can share it. <laughs> I, I lost <laughs> I think uh, just one thing I'd add, I'd add to that, um, that there are many different organizations doing amazing work that people can give money to. There are very, very few organiz organizations in the world where people can go for help if they're living uh, under a dictatorship or they want some way to find a way out non-violently of oppression. And this is the organization that people come to. And uh, I find it stunning as a journalist and a filmmaker that Jamila and Jean for 10 years have been working like this in this office, doing this incredible work out of all proportion to, um, to their resources. And one of the things I found when interviewing people who are the leaders or involved in nonviolent struggles is that there was always an occasion when they sat down and they said, and there was a discussion within a group saying, shall we take the violent option here? You know, we are uh, a capable group, we could potentially get weapons from another country, we could do this. And often, and across several groups, they said, the leadership said, let's try this first. I've got this book by Gene Sharp. Uh, this is something we can do. Let's try this first. And that is a, an absolute turning point. 
um, in these groups. So that is the, the tangible impact that this has on the ground and which uh, this work does. So it is so vital that if you know anyone um, or you come into contact with people, you can, can help it, that this work is, is supported and the academic work is extended and the brilliant work that Gina and Jamila are, are carrying on at the moment continues. One thing that I found very helpful was the inspiration from Sweden. Albert Myrdal was one of the people who took very, gave me very strong support for this particular type of work, including the whole book, The Politics of Unwound Action, and that was very important. But now it's beyond what Jamila has told you. Now the Norwegian Foreign Ministry has pledged us support for not as much as we might be able to use, the major support for three years program. This is the first governmental funding and not surprisingly it comes from the Nordic countries, uh, your neighbors. And uh, maybe S Swedish foreign ministry might be interested in that sometime. <laughs> but it, it's, it's very important if they're worried about terrorism. What, how is it that people can learn to do something instead of terrorism? And then you won't have to fight terrorism if people have chosen a wiser course of action that can be more effective in achieving your actual changes. Did it come back to you? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, it did. Uh, one very concrete thing that perhaps you can do is find out if the books of Jean's, Jean's writings and other material are available in your libraries or, you know, uh, at your universities. Uh, because, you know, we've been emphasizing the information and the need for the publications and the need to learn. Because, you know, what these books do, which is really amazing, is, is really teach people that there is an alternative. And, you know, without access to this material, then you can't become competent to sort of try to work through your own problems. So access to the material is very important. So, you know, we do our best to try to make sure our work is available online, but I happen to think it's really important to have printed copies and that libraries should carry them. So if you can ask your libraries if they, if they have at least some of the basic material and some of the more in-depth material, um, you know, we are very happy to supply them. Yeah. And translate to Swedish, I hope, someday. But yes. yes. So your question. Hi, uh, I'm Bobak and I'm coming from Iran. And uh, when I was watching uh, the parts from uh, Serbia, uh, I was quite surprised that, I mean, uh, what a nice uh, government they have. There's no snipers uh, shooting at the people who are coming to the, uh, to the parliament, and wow. And, uh, and then I watched uh, the part on Egypt, and I was again quite surprised that, okay, there are like uh, shooting people. But again, there was again some cameras from uh, like BBC, and then they, they're like freely shooting the like uh, getting pictures and everything. But then uh, I come to the uh, question: uh, When you have a government like Iran, and uh, which is uh, quite actually uh, is uh, provided with a lot of technology from uh, countries who are supposed to sanction it and is uh, technologically available to control everything and brainwash some people by religion to kill others so you cannot even use that to uh, be friends with police or anything then um, is there going to be any limit for non-violence action in this situation because like um, you are facing to people who are uh, who love to kill people because uh, they are buying places in heaven. So, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, because uh, I'm asking this because uh, the thing that we see in Syria now it started with a, a non-violent uh, uh, process, but then it, but then the ruler is that monstrous that uh, it seems like there is no end for killing. So they kill as much as they can and. Uh, so, is there any limit or...? Some years ago, when I started presenting these ideas in various places, people began to ask, well, where does this relevance stop? They were determined to, to discover where will it not work. That's a premature question. We discover first where it can work. And then we discovered that some of the places where 
it is impossible to do, have done it, and often been shot and killed, but many people in Oksa were saved. You know, would you have expected, you know, what Chechnya, all the killing of people who wanted to be independent again from Russia and the Russian Empire, Chechnya, incorporated into the Soviet Union. But comparison with Chechnya, look at Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, which are a little bit closer to you, where the people there, by the, out of their own inspiration, improvised symbolic types of protests, linking arms between the capitals from Tallinn in the north to Vilnius in the south, who linked arms at that continuing line of people people who had seen courses from the three countries, the Seeing Revolution, there's a wonderful, beautiful film about it. But that one wouldn't have been enough to get out of the Soviet Union. Uh, maybe the, the, the regime at that time didn't care too much about beautiful songs, you know. But what happened is that those governments took this seriously. The pro-independence elected governments in those countries, which were still in the Soviet Union, Republics of the Soviet Union, they used the strategy from my book on civilian based events to plan a strategy how to do it, and they did it very wisely with the respective defense ministers and state minister in Estonia. And they were, they had cuts, they were brave, and they got out of the Soviet Union with difficulties. With only 14 killed in, the, in Lithuania, eight in Latvia, and nobody killed in Estonia. And they got out quickly. Something is supposed to be impossible. So many of those places, Iran is, a, is an excellent place where lots of people have been killed. And they, they, because there's a problem, don't think that violence is going to be easier your casualty rates will be infinitely larger if you resort to violence. Your casualty rates will not be like the Baltic countries in those places of extreme oppression. But it is possible. If you don't win the first round in a, in a war, the first battle may be a defeat. But you have to replan, reorganize, prepare, and take the second struggle.